but it could be, I mean, one of the, the highest efficiency, um, lowest embodied carbon developments that's ever shown up in the United States, which is really, really cool. No, it's amazing. To uh, think about like 40 homes all yeah. built from wood, right? That was harvested within 50 miles of the place. Yeah. You had talked about in one of our meetings the other day, um, and I thought it was a really great concept. And, and I don't know if this is um, kind of fallen by the wayside because I know that some of the grant funding was lost or wasn't acted upon in a timely manner. But, mm-hmm. you know, there was the, the potential of you guys actually getting to, to build this, you know, 10,000 square foot facility. And, you know, when you were talking about it, you talked about, you know, partnering with, uh, you know, Phoenix Recycling and mm-hmm. using their plastic byproduct or all of their plastics to create your insulation for your homes and reducing, you know, the, whatever methodology they're using to recycle or haul off, you know, you're kind of cutting those down on the emissions. And so it's like all of a sudden, like just in a 20 minute conversation, I'm sitting there and not saying a word cause I'm a, a gigantic dummy. And, but it was just, it was so profound to think about realistically, you know, 90% of all of this could happen within a 50 mile radius of this area. Mm-hmm. You know, we're cutting down on shipping. We're cutting down on insulation. We're already recycling. Why not go ahead and buy that back and kind of redistribute that into these homes? And it was like, it was just checking all of these boxes. And it's like, this seems like, this seems like the product that makes the most sense, you know? And then, so I, I kind of left that meeting and started talking to, you know, some people about it sort of, you know, because I, I do think that, yeah, I am a real estate agent by trade um, and I, and I love the job, but I can't afford to buy a house here, you know, and that's, that's really scary. And then I think, okay, well, what about my children? You know, granted I, the market's not going to continually, you know, increases the way that we, it did over the last two years, but it, it starts to really kind of impact you in a local level of like, well, what do I do? Like, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, you know, helping people buy and sell homes or land all day long. But if the people that live here and breathe here, and it's not a second home or it's not a, we're buying right. a house for our, our, you know, our son who's going to the Fort Lewis college, you know, that really starts to impact you, you, you like in a, in a physical way. And it's almost like you feel like this layer of almost, you know, a depression because you're like, well, like I can't even, I can't even function in this community. You know, what am I going to do? And so it's, it really started to impact me in that way. And then I was talking to other people trying to get this concept of what you, you know, and loosely paraphrasing what you're trying, you know, and I can't even come close to articulating what you said and, but just talking about it. And like one of the common like strings that I kept getting back from people was like this, like modular concepted, you know, mo- modular conception, you know, and it's like, well, you know, it's like almost there's this stigma mm-hmm. around a pre-manufactured or like a modular concept. Right. And it's like, you, you almost have to go in there with like a, a PowerPoint to, to show people like, okay, here, l- let me just put this into perspective for you guys. Like these three hotels in this corridor of Durango, it's modular construction. These walls were made in a manufactory, you know, a plant someplace in Ohio, or they were made elsewhere and brought into here. Right. And so it's like, we're okay with that because what? We stay there one or two nights a year on vacation and everybody's okay with it. It looks great on the outside, but there's a stigma against you living in a manufactured home. What, mm-hmm. what is the difference? We're, we're actually saving time. We're saving energy. And these, these gentlemen, like, you know, coming, having been an electrician for years, you know, the summer months are great working, but yeah, you still are. You're going from the truck, you're going to here, you're going from the, and there's no systems in play because we're constantly juggling different trades. You know, the electricians right. are stepping on the plumbers and this finished trade is stepping on this rough end trade. And so it's like, there's no, you know, uh, practices or procedures set in place that you can do in an assembly line, you know? And so then in my head, I'm going, well, this is way more effective. And then God forbid there's a snowstorm and right. we've got to put up a 30 foot ladder to hang up a sconce that some millionaire bought in Glacier Club. You know, <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. This is not cost effective for anybody. And so I found it so strange that that was the, not, not the only, but one of the like commonalities. And I, I think that that has to come from other industries that, you know, you do see, and th- this is, this is not a negative on anybody that lives in a mobile home or, or, you know, mm-hmm. uh, a manufactured home on a permanent foundation, whatever. Like those, a person has to do what they have to do in this life to be able to, to move forward, right? I, I will not put any shade on anybody living in that. But even from a, an appraisal standpoint, you know, a modular home is always appraised less than a stick-built home. Mm-hmm. And I'm going, okay, 
So it adheres to HUD standards. Any more of those have changed, and now they're two by four walls and they're two by six exterior walls. What's the difference? You're saying that this is a less value because it was made over here, put on a trailer, and shipped to here. So then I'm going, it's still a house. It's on a permanent foundation. You can't get a loan unless it's strapped to that permanent foundation. That sounds real similar to floor joists in a stick built home. And in your exterior walls are two by six. That's exactly what a, you know, a stick built mm-hmm. home looks like. And then, wow, your snow load has to be you know, rated towards the county. Uh, same thing with a stick built home. You, know, you start checking all these boxes. I'm going, what's the difference? It's the stigma that has come with it. Maybe they, maybe for years and years, they, they weren't manufactured to a quality standard that we wanted or that we got out of a sick bill, but that doesn't have to be the case. Right. In fact, in forward. many ways, it's so much more regulated yeah. than anything that's going to happen in the field. Yeah. So that was the, that, you know, that stigma, yeah. it, it, that's why I wanted you on here so bad is like, okay, this is a product. This is a viable product. It's a viable product for creating jobs in our area, for reducing, you know, our carbon footprint and having less impact. You know, using mm-hmm. product that's already like, you know, the, like you said, the force of like using products here, how do we go about getting people to have a mental shift to get around the stigma that's associated with modular construction? And that's a good one. I, you know, I think one of the best examples that I've heard used and that, that I tend to use is how weird would it be if you wanted a new car and, and you started talking with Ford or Lexus or Toyota or whoever, and they were like, well, um, we're going to have to get our subs together, and <laughs> and we'll try and get everybody to show up in your driveway, right, in the right sequence, and, you know, it's it's hard to get everybody organized, so sometimes you'd be like, okay, I might have my house, I might have my car built, right, in a mm-hmm. year and a half. So So we take for granted the efficiencies and effectiveness of offsite manufacturing in almost every other area of life except for our homes. And the irony is it's usually the most expensive thing that we ever buy. Sure. So we would never accept someone showing up and building our car in our driveway over the course of several months. Mm-hmm. That's a really good analogy. Actually, that <laughs> that hits home pretty well. I'd never thought about it like oh that. Oh my gosh, so, it yeah. is. And so, so I just don't, I think that it, but I guess, I don't know that I'm answering whatever the deeper thing is. And I, I think what we're noticing is so often the main reason that people have moved away um, was in a race to the bottom for the least cost item. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that we have to be so careful because a, a when we when we are trying to make the cheapest thing possible, there really is no win. Because as long as people are valuing the price over the quality, mm-hmm. and I think that that's that's the other piece in in homes that really makes it difficult is you want you want the value of this entity this home to go up over time, but you're not expecting it to own it for its lifetime, and so. The, the housing industry is super confusing because there are all of these different competing definitions of success. Mm-hmm. The homeowner is like, well, it doesn't need to last 30 years. I don't, I mean, I'm going to be here for seven sure, on average, and I just want it to have good resale. And so, so if you're trying to sell durability, you'd think that that would have a ton of value to an individual homeowner, but I don't know that it has as much as all of the instantaneous things that they're going to get, which is going to be, what did I have to pay for it? How big is my monthly note? Mm-hmm. How much does it cost to heat and cool? So that's like one of those places where you start to be able to see um, some some immediate benefit of quality mm-hmm. start to show up, but you have to be able to tell that story well. Sure. And and I think that's that's a huge challenge. 